Welcome to lecture 1.6, the formal definition of a group. Now we have been calling the members that make up a group actions because our definition requires a group to be a collection of actions that satisfy our four rules. Since the standard definition of a group is not phrased in terms of actions, we will need more general terminology. We will call the members of a group elements. In general, a group is going to be a set of elements satisfying some set of properties. And I think I've probably slipped and, and, and said the word element before in previous lectures. And hopefully you know what I meant because um, even when we were calling them actions, we're talking about a collection or a set of actions. And elements are generally what we call things in a set. So we will also use standard set theory notation. So I will write things like this to mean H is an element of the group V4. Okay, so let's begin. Um, intuitively, an operation is a method for combining objects. I'm sure you've seen these before in your earlier math classes. So for example, uh, things like addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division are all elementary examples of operations. And in fact, these things are binary operations because they combine two objects into a single object. So for all of these things, you need two objects to start with. You need like A plus B, or A times B, and then you get out a single object. Here's a formal definition of a binary operation. So let me use star here, this asterisk, to be just a generic operation. You can think of it as multiplication if you want to, but it doesn't have to. It can be function composition, or it can be something weirder. So if star is a binary operation on a set, well, what we mean by that is that we can always take two elements in the set and multiply them together, and we get something that remains in the set. So in this case, we say that S is closed under this operation. Now, combining or multiplying two group elements, i.e. doing one action followed by the other, is a binary operation. We say that it is a binary operation on the group because we want to think of a group as, as a set. Recall that our rule four in our informal definition of a group says that any sequence of actions is an action. This ensures that the group is closed under the binary operation of multiplication, or of combining, if you prefer that. But we're going to start using multiplication most of the time. Multiplication tables are nice because they depict the group's binary operation in full. You see exactly what happens if you take any S and any T and multiply them together. However, not every table with symbols in it is going to be the multiplication table for a group. And that's something that we've seen. Um, you cannot have two of the same element in the same row or the same column. But those are not the only restrictions. There are some more subtle uh, requirements as well. So recall um, that an operation is associative. You probably saw this in a few previous classes, like your, maybe your intro to proofs class. If parentheses are permitted anywhere but required nowhere. I think that's the best way to define what it means to be associative. For example, ordinary addition and multiplication are associative. Right? Because, I mean, you can write A plus B plus C equals whatever it is. So parentheses are permitted anywhere but required nowhere. In other words, I can put my parentheses there and that doesn't change the outcome. Or I could have put my parentheses somewhere else. However, subtraction of integers is not associative. Because 4 minus 1 minus 2 is not the same as 4 minus 1 minus 2. So let me ask you, is the operation of combining actions in a group associative? Yes or no? Think about that. The answer is yes. We will not actually prove this fact, but rather we will illustrate it with an example. Let's recall D3. This is the group of symmetries for the equilateral triangle. It's the triangle puzzle. It's generated by R, which is rotate, and F, which is a horizontal flip. How do the following compare? doing R, then doing F, and then doing R. I claim that that's the same thing as doing R and then F, and then doing R. Or by doing R and then doing F and R. 
You see how the parentheses doesn't make any difference? Even though we are associating differently, the end result is that the actions are applied from left to right. The moral is that we never need parentheses when working with groups. That we may use them to draw our attention to a particular chunk in a sequence. So they're useful, but they're not necessary. Okay, so we are now ready to state the standard definition of a group. A set G is a group if the following criteria are satisfied. First, we need a binary operation on G. In other words, G has to be closed under this operation. That operation has to be associative. There has to be an identity element. This is like the do nothing action. Uh, specifically, uh, the identity multiplied by any element, either on the left or on the right, is just that element. So that holds for all G in the group. And finally, every element has an inverse that we write as, and say, G inverse, satisfying the following. That in either order, if you multiply them together, you just get back to that identity element. Now, a few remarks. So depending on the context, the binary operation may be denoted like star or a dot as in multiplication, or maybe addition. Sometimes we can have groups of numbers that we are adding together, or even a circle, especially if we're dealing with functions, and the operation is function composition. As with the ordinary multiplication, we frequently omit the symbol altogether, and, we'll, and we will write something like xy for x star y. But we only do that, typically, if our operation is actually multiplication. It wouldn't make sense to do this if we were talking about adding x and y together. Speaking of addition, we generally only use the plus symbol if the group is abelian. So g plus h always equals h plus g. But in general, g times h does not equal h times g. If you want to remember this, think about matrices. Adding matrices, the order does not matter. Multiplying matrices, it absolutely does. Finally, the uniqueness of the identity and inverses is not built into the definition of a group. However, we can, without much trouble, prove these properties. And that's what we'll do. I think we'll actually prove one of them in class and the other one will be left for the homework. A natural thing to ask is whether our two competing definitions actually agree. That is, if our informal definition says something is a group, will our official definition agree, or vice versa? Since our first definition of a group was informal, it's impossible to answer this question officially and absolutely, because there's some gray area. An informal definition potentially allows technicalities and ambiguities, as ours does. This aside, our discussion leading up to our official definition provides an informal argument for why the answer to the first question should be yes. And by the first question, I mean if our informal definition says something is a group, then our official definition will say that as well. So hopefully I've convinced you of that. And our second question, this is the vice versa part, if we have a group defined with our official definition, um, is it necessarily a group with the informal definition? We will answer that in the next chapter. So regardless of whether our definitions agree, we will always have that the inverse of the identity is the identity. In other words, the inverse of doing nothing is, of course, doing nothing. Even though we have not officially shown that these two definitions agree, and as I said, in some sense we can't, because there is ambiguity that is built into the first definition, we shall begin viewing groups from these two different paradigms. As a collection of actions and as a set with a binary operation. One of the first things we can prove about groups, something that's not built into the definitions, is uniqueness of the identity and inverses. So here's that first statement as a formal theorem. Every element of a group has a unique inverse. Let's prove this. So let's let G be an element of a group big G. By definition, it has at least one inverse. 
So let's do the same technique that we did in proving that elements can only appear once in every row and every column of a multiplication table. Let's suppose that we have two inverses. Let's call them H and K. Now we're not going to actually come up with a contradiction, but we're going to show that H and K have to be the same. The fact that H and K are both inverses of G means that GH and HG both equal E, and GK and KG also equal E. As I said, it suffices to show that H and K are actually the same. That will prove uniqueness. Indeed, H equals H times E. This is the identity. Now, since the identity is G times K, I can stick that right here. And now you can't stop me from moving the parentheses like this. And now what is H times G? Well, that's also the identity. So that's the identity times K. And the proof is complete. We started with H and showed that is equal to K. So maybe this was a trick here. What we actually did is we took the element G and we multiplied it on the left by one of the inverses H and on the right by the other inverse K. And then we said, well, by moving the parentheses around, we can get this thing to equal H like this or by K like that. The following proof, which I will not do here, but instead you will do in the homework, is very similar. Every group has a unique identity element. So let me give you a hint about how to get started. It's going to be very similar. Let's suppose that we have two identity elements. So let's suppose that we have E1 and E2 that are both identity elements, meaning that G times E1 equals E1 times G, which is equal to G. This is for all G in the group. And the same thing holds for E2. G times E2 equals E2 times G equals G for all G in and G. You have to show that E1 equals E2. And it has to be convincing. If you write the proof up and you look at it and you say, I don't know if it's actually a proof. I feel like I might have waved my hands and cheated a little bit. It's probably not right. So once you get it and you know you've gotten it, you'll be sure.